Uh, I'm Matt. And this is Billy. And you're listening to the Bible Bro Down podcast. So, uh, yeah. What's up? How you been? Good. Ready for the holidays. This is, uh, we are recording this in the week before Christmas. This is actually the first recording that we, yeah, this is actually the first recording, um, that we're doing where our podcasts have actually been released. We've released episode one, blogcast one, and episode two. And uh, we can proudly say we've had at least 12 people listen to us. <laughs> That's what's up, not counting us. Yeah, because I haven't listened to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was taking, I talked in it. <laughs> I was taking myself out of that equation. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So it's exciting. We're actually officially out there on like iTunes and Google Play now. So I know a lot of people may not like listen to us via their computer at their house. And they would prefer to listen to us, you know, in their car. And oftentimes it's hard to find where is that post that is the link to their podcast. Well, now you can just look us up in iTunes or Google Play, hit subscribe, and we will be there every week. In your ears. Yes. Dude, I'm excited. I am too. It's winter finally. <laughs> we don't. I don't sweat walking to the car. It's so nice. Yeah. So Matt lives in Texas. I live in South Dakota. <laughs> um, when Matt says he's excited, I'm saying, "Oh no, I'm in pain." So now, now when I walk to my car, I literally have pain <laughs> from the cold. You know, it was this past weekend. It was negative, like eight degrees with a wind chill of like negative thirty. And Matt's like, "Oh yeah, it's like you know fifty degrees here." I'm like, "Yeah." Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah but in my defense i i should I, i'm allowed to make fun of you uh non-stop for the rest of winter because all summer when you <laughs> or at least starting in about september when you're like hey it's like 60 degrees outside it was still 90 something here so yes you were you were That's jealous true. of me and now it's my turn <laughs> to be jealous of you I, I was definitely coveting your weather for sure yeah so today i was listening to the polemics report matt and um yeah, I'm not probably going to listen to that a lot. <laughs> and I, I, I had a he, JD Hall was talking about charismatics and Armenians and the danger of it, and, yeah. and, and, and Armenians and and saying that he he firmly believes that uh, charismatic uh, the view that the the gifts have not have not ceased is is much more dangerous than being an Armenian. And a comment that he said, I want you to <laughs> tell me, what does it mean? What does the phrase mean? No more direct divine revelation outside of scripture. Well, the cessationist view is that God is not providing more revelation, uh, uh, prophetic revelation, like he did with, uh, say, John uh, in the book of Revelation. He's got that that has ceased. At least the gift has ceased. It's not something that people get anymore. Uh, there's still, I, I don't think Jordan would, would disagree with a, uh, a form of prophecy that isn't future telling, so to speak. I know that there's different mm -hmm. ways to understand that gift. Um, but as far as someone standing up and saying, so says the Lord, uh, and then giving a future prophecy, the cessationist view is that that's not happening anymore. I completely ag agree with that idea, kind of. Um, that we don't no longer we no longer have the gift of prophecy, um, and he mentioned that specifically, you know, prophecy, prophetic mm -hmm. things. But he also mentioned, you know, nobody hears from the spirit, and because he was talking about basically interpreting or getting a divine word from the Lord about something or something, and, and mentioned this whole like no direct divine revelation outside of Scripture. And I was thinking, I, I don't, I can't, I cannot gr agree with that that statement at all. No direct divine revelation outside of Scripture, because to me, he's saying that the only way that we we learn about God is is through the Scripture. And I think JD, if you actually brought this up to him, would would probably actually say, well, yeah, you're you're right, but maybe he wouldn't just because he doesn't want to be wrong. But anyway, would not the Spirit witnessing the gospel to you and the truth of the gospel be direct and divine revelation? Direct, yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I, I think, <laughs> and isn't the, the spirit is, of God uh, divine? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, but I, I think the difference is one is a conviction, personal conviction, whereas it, I think the and maybe I'm I'm, I'm giving him too much credit. I don't know, uh, but I think there's a difference between personal conviction of the gospel and uh, his witness versus a. A, the spirit speaking to someone uh, concerning the entire church, which I, actually I think it's we can't say that that's completely stopped because we know uh, in the end times that it's going to start again. 
Absolutely. Um, and I think that's... Particularly through two people. Yeah. Yeah. The the whole... I, it, it actually gives a different word on, on prophecy versus gift of tongues. You know, tongues will cease mm-hmm. and prophecy will... Um, how does it say? I don't remember. It's like suspended or something yeah. like that. And and I, yeah. I, I think that the two witnesses will, will be giving us prophecies. Uh, if you don't do this, then this will happen or this will happen in the next few days. And, <laughs> and I think we will see that made uh, plainly clear during that time. I was thinking the other day, uh, man, we can't get off on an eschatology uh, <laughs> uh, rabbit, but, but just very shortly, I was thinking the other day. Uh, so Billy and I are both uh, post-trib pre-mill, meaning we, we believe that there's no rapture before the tribulation. We go through the bad stuff, but that the, the millennium where Christ comes and reigns for a thousand years is literal and that will, the, the bride will be there with him, the church, the believers now. Uh, and I was thinking in our glorified bodies, will we all have right now, we all have a portion of the spirit or, uh, our, our spiritual gifts, but in our, <clears throat> excuse me, in our glorified bodies, will we have them all? So when it says that, that prof- pro- prophecies have been suspended in the future, when, when our, when we're not struggling with the body of death, <clears throat> excuse me, which we'll talk about here in a minute, when we're not struggling with that body of death and, and sin and, and it constantly, uh, encouraging us to rebel uh, and we have a body that's free of that, will, will God give us all of the spiritual gifts? I mean, will we be, I just assume we'll be way more in line with <laughs> with him than we ever were or yeah. ever possibly could be. <clears throat> That's actually I've, I've taught on the spiritual gifts in the past, and and I say that the spiritual gifts are almost like attributes or characteristics of the Lord: teaching yeah. and wisdom and love and faith and you know giving and mercy and compassion. You know, exhortation. All those things are are parts of who Christ is, who our Lord is, and He has given you know His His body those pieces in order for us to all come together and share those things and, and build us up to have all those, you know, just because you haven't been given the spiritual gift of teaching doesn't mean that you cannot learn to be a teacher. In fact, you are encouraged to learn to be a teacher. In fact, Paul tells in one of the passages, he says, you should all be teachers by now. Uh, the same thing with the, the gift, the gift of giving somebody might be spiritually gifted to, to give, but we are all called to give. Somebody might be spiritually gifted to love, but we are all called to love. These are all things. So I, I'm not sure about prophecy and, and miracles and all those. I don't know if those are included in that. Healings, tongues, yeah. uh, being able to speak and other people understand it. I think it absolutely could be a thing right. in the future, but that, yeah, that depends on eschatology and in your outlook on that <laughs> but mm-hmm. let's not go down that rabbit hole too far <laughs> although i have we definitely will in the future because it's it's sweet to study won't be fun to go through so hey you want to give us a, a, a quick review recap what we talked about last couple of episodes and then we'll dive into our question and what we're talking about today sure uh let's see we are on episode six so we have talked about uh, episode one. We talked about kind of the differences of, of what we believe compared to everyone else. Episode two, we talked about the mystery of the gospel and, and what the gospel really is. And in essence, you know, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, uh, not saved by works, but saved through faith. That's part of the good news is that righteousness is received through faith based on the Lord's grace, which comes through Christ's atonement on the cross. We hold that the gospel has been the same from beginning to end, from Adam to, until you know the Lord returns. There's one gospel, and it's the, the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. That is, again, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You can find that phrase in Genesis 4. You can find that phrase uh, concerning Abraham. You can find that phrase concerning um, the in the New Testament. Paul teaches it clearly in Romans 10 that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, and he's specifically referring to uh, Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is our Lord, the same Lord that was in the Old Testament, the same Lord that was the I Am, the Shepherd, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, uh, the first and the last. All those terms are used in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Peter makes it clear in Acts chapter 10 that there is one Lord and he is Lord of all. Matt and I have kind of talked about how why is Christ the Lord of all? Because he bought all, he purchased the debt of our sin, and that has made him the Lord of all. He judges us now based on the gospel, and those who don't believe in the gospel um, are judged and condemned on their sin. But the first standard is the gospel, that do you believe in the gospel? If yes, then receive forgiveness and righteousness through the Lord, and if you do not, then you will be judged by your own uh, works, which uh, obviously no one can receive righteousness by their own works. And they will be judged and condemned because of their sin. 
we also talked about that was a long one wasn't it but it's, it's always good to, it's always good I, I i feel like that that idea of the gospel that there's so much tradition and so much people so many people who haven't questioned that 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 idea we went through all the scripture that talk about this how it's been taught in the old testament the new testament we went through all that so we would encourage you to not only go listen to those but also go look at our studies that that show the scripture teaches this as well we talked about who has heard the gospel um who's been given the command of the gospel we we showed that it's been God's um, through God's grace. He is He's made everyone uh, know the gospel. He witnesses it through His creation. He witnesses it personally by sowing it onto our hearts. He also uses other means. Uh, he tells His people to share the gospel, to to live the gospel. He he uh, writes His gospel within His written word, and He also provides m- miraculous means to to share His gospel. So. But it's, it's the power of the Spirit that is behind each and every one of those, whether it's through creation, through what's been sown on your heart, through the Scripture, through His people, or uh, through miraculous means. It's, it's the Spirit of God that witnesses those things. What else did we talk about? What was the last one we talked about? Oh, we went through specifically what we learned through creation and what has actually been sown onto our heart. Um, it's, it was an amazing uh, study to write. Uh, it was amazing to go through it again uh, on a podcast. Uh, so many people think, oh... We only know that God exists through creation. We learn so much more. We actually, yesterday, I, I, I was uh, on Facebook and somebody was asking a question about the law and how the Old Testament law applies to us now. And, and in doing that, uh, it kind of came out to me. It's something that we've taught, but it this haven't connected the dots for me. Matt, the, the law is what to us? It's supposed to be a what to us? Uh, it's a tutor, right? Right. It, it points us to Christ. It, it helps us understand that we are insufficient on our own. Right. And that's is that the written law or is that the the law on our hearts? Yes, exactly. So <laughs> if if the written law was to to teach people and point them to Christ, right? Basically, I cannot do all of these commands on my own, and I cannot earn my own salvation. It pointed us to our need for the Lord. It pointed us to our need for His grace. So the same law that the Lord has written on our hearts is also a tutor to Christ. We cannot follow these laws that we know are true, that God has written on our hearts. I can't do these. I can't, out of my own power and and will, follow these and earn his favor. I, I have to seek him and just follow on his mercy seat. That's that's the gospel. That's The, the, the law is a tutor <laughs> to you um, for the gospel. It teaches you that you need the Lord, that you can do nothing on your own, and that you must humble yourself and follow him in faith. And fortunately, he is, he's also shown us that he loves us and he is uh, compassionate and that he will forgive us of our sins and credit us with righteousness if we seek him in faith. Through all of that, the, there's, there's been an elephant in the room, right? We, we, we show how God has witnessed of himself so much. Uh, we, we will address, I'm sorry. It's just such a dumb question. We will address, uh, why it is we still witness personally, uh, later, <laughs> but yes, we, we witness as well and we're encouraged to, but anyway, the, the elephant in the room is, is, well, is a person capable of it? Are we born dead in trespasses and sins and incapable of trusting the gospel, even though we've heard it? Or do we, and do we need God to do some extra work, bring us to life spiritually before we can understand it? Or are we born corrupted? Do, as Paul says in Romans 7 near the end, do, we're born into this body of death, but we're still able to seek him after receiving some kind of provenient grace, as the Armenians would believe? Or is it, is it just simply, we can do some good and some bad. We constantly have sin uh, accosting us and getting us to rebel. But the witness of God is sufficient for us to humble ourselves to to uh, him and obey the command of the gospel. So we're, we're going to look today at what we believe spiritual death is and if it, it says anything about inability or or not. I would encourage people not only to continue to listen to us, but... Leighton Flowers uh, is a pastor. What what group is he part of? The he's something of Texas. <laughs> I should know this as it's like on in the beginning of every every one of his episodes. <laughs> he's in the promised land with me, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> um, he has a podcast you can look up uh, called Soteriology One Hundred and One, um, and he goes through this a lot too. On are we incapable or unable unable to respond to God's call? Mm-hmm. So um, yep. 
for those of you who are you know questioning this or you're open to the idea that your reform theology could be wrong in in being unable to respond to God, which is so interesting. Unable to respond to God. I mean, God is calling and you're unable to respond to God. It's just, oh, it's just I don't know. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, yeah, yeah. If you, if you So the podcast world is pretty dominated by Calvinistic podcasts. So I, I, absolutely. Uh, Soteriology 101 is a great one for an alternative view. Definitely orthodox. I'm not saying it's alternative to what you, you're taught in church, but it's a, it's a, uh, it's a different take on a lot of the scripture. And he does a really good job of breaking down some of the quote unquote Calvinist stronghold scriptures. Um, yeah. That aren't really that strong when you look at them. So let's die. So the, the way we're going to break it out, we're going to take a kind of circuitous route to what we believe spiritual death is. And, and we're doing it for a reason. First, we're going to go ahead and uh, explain how we understand original sin. There's there's several different ways you can look at it. All of them, I think, are orthodox, and I think the the exact definition of original sin or uh, what it is that comes from Adam is still debated. I mean, depending on what circle you're in, you're going to believe one thing or another. But after that, we're going to take a trip through uh, the Book of Life and uh, whether or not children are under grace or they are born under condemnation and really understand that. And then we'll give you our, if you haven't already figured it out by that time, our definition of spiritual life, spiritual death, and then take a look at some of the the contrary opinions and hopefully we do them justice as well. So original sin. Well, you want to say something? I was going to say, and then uh, on the 20th episode, because this is going to take about, you know, 15 episodes. <laughs> <laughs> a year later. We're going to... <laughs> We're gonna try to try to keep it short. We're gonna crash we're gonna course. try. <laughs> okay, yes, it's a crash course. We, it, yeah, that's a good point. We've written a lot about this, and and if if you want to see a lot more depth to what we're saying, uh, definitely go to uh, BibleRoadDown.com. Hit the studies page. We've got a lot there. Probably a good place to start is the master plan section. Mm-hmm. Uh, that 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 series kind of breaks down exactly what we believe, and probably something we need to go back and reread and and, and add to. Yeah, because uh, it's not long enough. No, <laughs> but I, 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 this is definitely going to be a truncated version of of the arguments we give in in writing. But just to whet your appetite, so yeah. Original sin, a very basic definition is that it. Original sin is the concept that uh, a sin nature, possibly guilt, was passed from Adam to every human born after him. Adam and Eve were the first. Everybody alive on earth came from them. So when he sinned, he was uh, condemned to death. He didn't die. We'll talk about that. But after that, every single person on earth is born uh, at the minimum with a a body of death, with, with sin dormant in us waiting to rebel at the first command we have or we're given. Uh, and we see that in uh, Romans 5, 12 through 14. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin... And so death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness and offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come, him being Christ. So the uh, Paul gives us here a clear understanding that death came from Adam and spread to all men. And there's a few ways we can take a look at this. Uh, B, do you want to break it down? <laughs> me and matt spent about 45 minutes talking about this before we started <laughs> <laughs> yes we did and i imagine we could probably spend another couple hours on it too yeah uh, it's something actually give us the short version the short something version. actually just popped in my mind when we were when you were reading this oh no that kind of fits with with our understanding actually and goes back to kids um so there's multiple ways or multiple doctrines multiple theologies whatever you want to call it multiple ways people interpret um, original sin and what that means some say that spiritual death spread to all men because those men committed sins meaning that their their guilt was not on them at birth it actually became uh, they became guilty after their own sin um i think those same people obviously would believe that physical death did spread to all men the other way of looking at this is that all men are sinful under the uh, headship of Adam and therefore deserve death at birth. Uh, that death, they would say, is both physical death and spiritual death. Despite having committed neither good nor evil at birth, a person is guilty because of Adam. 
So basically, they 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 hold the understanding that because of Adam uh, and the the sin of Adam, we are all sinners. Immediately deserve hell. Yeah, right? yeah. Immediately deserve hell the moment we are born, and really, I guess that would the moment we were conceived. Conception. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then um, I, I guess what we are gonna just lay out there for now is that we believe that physical death. Original sin uh, meant that physical death spread to all men. There isn't anyone alive today that is born that isn't going to physically die unless have, the Lord happens to return <laughs> sooner. <laughs> but so physical death. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. That that sin uh, basically corrupted our physical nature. You could almost look at it as a sin as a as a disease and that it's in our flesh and that we are all going to – and we are all – under physical death, there's not one person that that will not sustain physical death. Again, we all would also agree that corruption uh, spread to all men, and that our flesh, what is in our physical nature, will lead us to sin. And what what we're going to really kind of talk about, I guess, within this with in this podcast is when does guilt occur, and when does this this idea of spiritual death uh, occur? When is that? When are we? guilty before god exactly so first let's take a look at at adam uh we want to take you know children out of the mix for a minute because we're, we are going to talk about them uh let's just look at adam and and why god promised him death and yet he didn't die so we're going to rewind to genesis 2 15 and 16 then the lord god took the man and put him into the garden of eden to cultivate it and keep it the lord god commanded the man saying from any tree of the garden you may eat freely but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you will surely die. Obviously, he didn't surely die, like in a physical way then. I've, I've heard some pastors and teachers argue that, well, God was talking about a spiritual death there. Well, I certainly believe Adam was had sinned and he was then separated from God. But but why wasn't he immediately punished and, and sentenced to death? Or why wasn't he killed and, and condemned to hell at that very moment? Right. Did Adam deserve God's judgment and condemnation? 100%. And, and punishment the, the second that he sinned against God? Yep. Do we deserve God's judgment and condemnation the second that we sin against God? Yep. Yep. So why don't we die? Why doesn't God just judge us and condemn us? So we're going to back up again to Romans 5 and take a look at verse 15. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, the many died... So much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. Just that verse alone, you could keep going, read through 1920. Uh, but again, we're trying to keep it short. Just that, that, that verse alone. That so many people, and I did for a long time, understand the, this passage to be talking about spiritual death in life. But we think now that it's appropriate to, to understand this as physical, that under Adam, everybody deserved to die. We're born with this with this corrupted sin, a uh, corrupted nature, this corrupted flesh that's going to encourage us to rebel at any commandment, and that deserves to be wiped out. It's sinful. It's it's uh, ugly in the eyes of the Lord. It's uh, disdainful. The only reason He doesn't punish us immediately at conception or just stop the human race completely is because of the work of Christ. It it He. Uh, the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to the, or abound to the many. God passed over our sins because of his foreknowledge of the work he would do as Christ on earth. Knowing that there was justification by faith, he did not punish us immediately. He allowed us to live and to prosper um, <laughs> into billions of people because of Christ. You didn't include it here, but you know we've mentioned this verse multiple times in, in the past few podca- uh, podcasts, uh, Romans chapter 3, around... 20s in the 20s there uh i'm just going to read verse 25 talking about christ and and dying on the cross god publicly displayed him at his death as the mercy seat accessible through faith this was to demonstrate his righteousness because god in his forbearance had passed over the sins previously committed so why did god pass over the sins previously committed because of christ's foreordained work on the cross christ uh you know his death and 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 resurrection uh, and, and atonement was pre- uh, foreknown and predestined to, to occur. And because of that, because Christ actually purchased and atoned for your sins, he bought, in essence, the contract from the Father uh, on your sin, um, God is now patient with us 
passing over our sins and offering us salvation through the gospel. That has been the same since Adam until Christ returns. You know, we are judged based on our obedience to the gospel by calling upon the name of the Lord in faith, walking in faithfulness. That is what we are judged by. We, we, we've seen this, uh, you can see this in the Exodus, you know, in, in Egypt and in Pharaoh and Moses, that Israel all were passed over in God's immediate judgment that he brought down with the angel of death, right? The Israelites, <laughs> last time I said this, I mentioned the, the lamb was on the doorpost <laughs> and you made fun of me, but, um, it was the, uh, the, the lamb's blood, you know, on their doorpost that allowed God to pass over them and not judge them immediately. Were they just as, were they, were they sinners? Absolutely. Was this, was what God, was God passing over their sin here a sign of forgiveness? No. Were they righteous because of this? No. God passed over their sin and allowed them to go into the wilderness where he then offered them, uh, through the cloud, through the manna, through the rock of life, through the water, a chance for salvation. And if they were to follow him in faith, they would enter his rest. They would enter the promised land. That's the same with us. Mm-hmm. God, through through Christ's atonement on the cross, passes over our sins and offers us salvation. All of us are passed over right now and not judged immediately. God has every right, again, to judge us immediately for our sin and throw us into hell. But he doesn't. He, as, as the scripture says, he's patient with us, you know, not wishing for any to perish, but to all to come to repentance. He desires all of us to be saved. He is currently passing over our sins and offering us salvation through the gospel, which was only possible because Christ died at the cross for our sins. Yeah, I think it's interesting in that story, uh, in the the Exodus story, uh, during the Passover, if someone did not offer a lamb and, and paint their doorway with the blood, there was they, they still lived, but through the sacrifice of their firstborn. There was still, God was still passing over people. There was going to be a sacrifice one way or the other. There was a lamb or it was the firstborn, but th- both are, in a way, as you've pointed out, Shadows of Christ, mm-hmm. who was the the only begotten, uh, the Lamb of God. He was sacrificed for us so that we can live. That's an amazing shadow. This goes kind of. We should bring it up here because it's so important to um, this whole debate on Christ's atonement. Was it for everyone, or was it for only the elect? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, with our understanding and through the Scripture, it clearly says that Christ is the Savior of the world. That Christ died for all especially believers, kind of makes the distinction. So he died for all, and then clarify, especially believers. So now we have all and especially believers. Well, how did Christ die for all, especially believers? How did Christ, uh, how do the, the, the false teachers and the false prophets deny the master who bought them if Christ actually didn't buy them with the atonement? You want to answer this, Matt? I'm sure you know the answer. <laughs> Actually, r- repeat the question one more time because uh, you got me thinking about something else, and then uh, <laughs> my mind wandered. It happens. I'm sorry. How, how does the atonement actually apply to all people? How did Christ actually atone for all of your sins? How did He buy all of your sins? How did He purchase everyone's sins? I feel like this is a too easy of a question. Is this a trick question? <laughs> this is. I a, mean, I mean, we've <laughs> look at Facebook in this past week. How many people and how many people debate this on limited atonement and and all these things? And, and we 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 understand that they're conflating all sorts of different things. I just it, it's it, the the application of it to. So obviously, it's through Christ. It's through God coming in the flesh, living a perfect life, dying uh, as a perfect sacrifice. It explains this in Hebrews that the the goats and the bulls were just a shadow of the the true sacrifice that could actually remove sins. The application of it to all time was that the father foreknew this action that he would have the son do. And so he graciously applied it to everybody. It wasn't required. Uh, it's just, it, it's, it's all by grace, grace alone. So it's, that's how it's applied to everybody is it's, it's God's will that it was. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. When, when Christ died on the cross, uh, we can try to use financial terms because I think people can understand that. It, it, he purchased the, uh, the contract the uh, the uh, you know based on the law of sin and death that because of sin your sin you deserve death that's that's you know a, a law of God a law of sin and death Christ purchased or, or paid that debt to sin now he owns the contract he owns the debt so the judgment has passed from the Father judging you on your sin because Christ purchased the contract now he is the judge he is the judge of all people he purchased the debt. And now he judges you, judges you based on the gospel. So now you're passed over. He offers you salvation through the gospel. If you reject the gospel, 
you're, you're rejecting your only means of being saved. If you reject the gospel, now you're judged. So he judges you based on the gospel. So now you're judged. You're refusing his, his payment now. He, he, he doesn't take the fact that he did pay it. Again, he's, he's your, um, mortgage holder. Is that a good word? Yeah. He's your mortgage yep. holder. So he actually purchased your debt. He holds your mortgage. Now you're rejecting him to, to pass that, right? And, and, and apply it to you. You're rejecting that offer by rejecting the gospel. You're saying you can reject grace? I didn't think that was, I mean, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. That was a, that was a dig. Um, <laughs> I should know. Actually, it, well, let's, let's, there's let's, two parts well, let's get back on topic. By, by grace, God is presently passing over your sins and offering you salvation. He offers you additional grace through the gospel. Um, you can reject that offer, the, the, the gospel, the, the covenant of faith. You can reject that. You can reject. Mm-hmm. And again, if you reject it, it by no means takes away that he purchased your debt. Now, instead of being judged by the father, Christ is going to judge you based on your sin and your death because he owns your contract. So you see how atonement applies to everyone, especially believers. It applies to everyone because he's presently passing over your sins. He owns your debt and offering you salvation. It applies especially to believers because they accept that salvation and he forgives them and credits them with righteousness. Those that don't accept are rejecting his offer, his free gift, and instead choosing to try to earn their own righteousness. And in doing so, um, again, it takes no. Way, it doesn't take away from his purchasing their their debt. They're just now judged by him because he is the judge of all. Yep. So let let's before we keep go keep going on that because I know you could talk for another hour and a half on it. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's bring it back to the the, the topic for today um, and take a look at, at sin nature and and what it is we get. God, as you said, God has passed over our sins. We are sinful, but God is not judging us immediately uh, and killing us because he he desires all to be saved. First Timothy two four. Second uh, Peter three nine, mm-hmm. right? So uh, it, we see in, in Romans seven, basically the entire chapter, Paul is talking about the struggle with with the body. Now, some people may say, "Well, he's a Christian struggling with with uh, the spirit versus the flesh." Uh, so, some people actually think that the tense change. I think it's a tense change in a uh, around. I think verse fourteen means that I don't even remember what that argument was. I just I knew I disagreed with it. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Straw man there. But anyway, it, Romans 7, I'm going to read 7 through 11, and, and we could talk about what's going on here. Uh, so what shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have known. T- uh, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but then when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So <laughs> there's a lot there. Um, a lot, a lot. I'm going to read the next verse because we're going to, I'm going to mention it later. So yeah, for sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So then the law is holy and the commandment whatever this commandment is, is holy and righteous and good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good point. <laughs> Very important. So right off the bat, what what we see is that Paul is talking about sin dwelling in him almost as if it's a, a separate kind of being. I'm not <laughs> personifying uh, sin, but it, it's it's laying there waiting. It's like a virus. It's just it's waiting for, for a command. In verse 8, but sin, taking opportunity through the command, produced in me coveting of every kind. As soon as we receive a command, even a child, we're, we're parents, we see this all the time, any parent listening to this knows their children will rebel <laughs> when you give them a, uh, a rule to follow. The sin is in us, in every single person, rebelling at every command we have. And we either follow sin or we, we don't. Mm-hmm. What else do you see here? Uh, a ton. <laughs> <laughs> just pick, just pick one. And then we'll <laughs> so many people think that this commandment that Paul is talking about is "you shall not covet," right? The law and the commandment, and all throughout this commandment is the whole thing: "you shall not covet." But it's not. It, he, Paul, as you can see, kind of from the beginning, is the law sin may never be. On the contrary, or I would not have come to known sin except through the law. And you can take that. Um, just so people understand, uh, the law is not only the, the written law, but the law written on our hearts. We know sin through the law written on our hearts. Uh, Romans 2 makes that clear. 
I would not mm-hmm. have known about coveting had the law not said you should not covet. So when we covet something and we have that conviction within us that tells us that it's wrong, guess what? We, we know that the law just taught us that what we're doing is wrong through that conviction. Uh, but sin taking opportunity through the commandment produced in me coveting of every kind, for apart from the law, sin is dead. Uh, I was once, here's, here's kind of where we're going with this, the whole spiritual life, spiritual death. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I, and I died. So you have to ask yourself when you're reading this, what is Paul talking about? He was alive apart from the law. When this commandment, whatever it happens to be, came, sin became alive and I died. So now we're, we're talking about spiritual life and spiritual death here and, and what that means. So, or, go ahead. Or zombies. It could be zombies. We don't know. <laughs> right. I mean, he died, but he continued to live a uh, walking dead kind of thing, maybe. So, no, obviously it's spiritual. Yeah. So I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, again, whatever happens, what, what this commandment happens to be, was to result in life, proved to result in the death of me. So, Matt, you want to just go ahead and spill the beans. What was this commandment that Paul is talking about? It, it, it has to be. The only thing it can be is the gospel. Uh, it, if you look at uh, is it, it Romans 10 and Deuteronomy, oh, help me out, 30? 31? Mm-hmm. 30. 30. Yeah, it, it, God says he places life and death before us, choose life. He explains that there's a command uh, to, to basically seek him, and that is life. So when he says, when he says I was once alive apart from the law, you, you, we have to understand that early in his life, for an undetermined period of time, he, was, he, he, can, he understands that he was spiritually alive. But then this commandment, which he calls it the commandment, not the law, which he, he clearly are two different things. The commandment came. Sin, this dormant sin that was in him, became alive and he died. Obviously, spiritually, we're not talking zombies. So it, it, this commandment this, that he received is the gospel. And it is him. Well, yeah, I guess there's no way, <laughs> there's no way to postpone it. it. This spiritual death is his, his condemnation according to the gospel. He is now accountable for all the sin that was in him. Now that it has, quote unquote, come alive, became alive. Right. Just to throw out some other clarifying things about this is the commandment that the definite article is in this passage, i.e. the. So it's, it's talking about a specific commandment. We can also look that the commandment uh, is was to produce life. People think that if this is referring to <laughs> thou shall not covet, um, thou shall not covet cannot produce life in any way or fashion. Not only that, um, the commandment that, that produces life, as most people I think would, would know, is the gospel. By obeying the gospel, you receive eternal life. It, let's look down at the, the, the passage, that, the, the extra verse that I added into this that Matt didn't read about. Verse 12, I already moved my mouse. So then the law is holy. So the, the law that's written on our heart is holy. It's a good thing. The written law is holy. It's a good thing. The commandment, right? So if, if again, if this is talking about the that you should not covet, uh, this kind of shows that it's not because that would fall under the law. Um, so this commandment is separate from the law. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. It is the gospel command that is holy, righteous, and good. It is a law that is holy that teaches us our need for the gospel, to obey the gospel. It is the command of the gospel that is holy, righteous, and good. Uh, going back to Matt mentioned Deuteronomy 30, verse 11. And we've, we've talked about a lot. We've written on this on our website. Go under uh, our study section. Go to our soteriology section. You will find a study there called uh, the gospel in the Old Testament or the gospel in Deuteronomy chapter 30. For those of you who are familiar, Deuteronomy 30 is the same book that Paul quotes in Romans chapter 10. Um, but listen to this. For the commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. It is not in heaven that you should say who will go up to heaven for us to get it, for us to, and, and for us to get, sorry, who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it that way that we may observe it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say who will cross the sea for us to get it and for us, get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it. So Paul is basically, he's kind of throwing some, or this is Moses actually, and Paul quotes this same, the same exact thing. You don't have to send somebody up into heaven to find this commandment and bring it to you and teach it to you. Nor do you have to send somebody out to the sea who goes and gets it and then brings it back to you so you can hear it. 
But the word, the word of the commandment, is very near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. Now, everybody who's read Romans chapter 10 knows Paul is basically quoting this verbatim, talking about the gospel. The word is very near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. Why is it near you? Why is this commandment near you? Why is it in your mouth and in your heart? And interesting that it says it's actually in your heart. Kind of like what me and Matt have talked about in our previous podcast, where the Lord has sown his word, sown the gospel in your heart, right? Why does he do this? So that you may observe it. So the whole reason that it's near you and in your mouth and in your heart is so that you can observe it. So uh, let me, uh, I agree for the reasons he just said, um, yes, the commandment there is, is the gospel. It is separate and different than the law. Although I do want to, to backtrack on what I said and, and clarify <laughs> the, uh, if you look at verse seven and eight, uh, for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said you should not covet, covet, but sin taking opportunity through the commandment. So, but Paul does, uh, equate law and, and the commandment to not covet there, the uh-huh. law being the, the overall law, the commandment being do not covet. However, again, for, for the reasons Billy just stated in verse nine, but when the commandment came, sin came, became alive and I died in verse 12. when it says that the, the commandment is good and holy and righteous. It is more than just don't covet, or it is more than just obey the Sabbath. That commandment is higher. <laughs> really, it's a summation of the law it, to love God, right? To seek him. We can't do it perfectly. Nobody will. Paul goes on and for the rest of Romans 7, explaining the, the struggle of, of the flesh, our sin nature, and how we continue to do the things we don't want to do, and we don't do the things we want to do, but that when we when we recognize that the things we're doing are sinful, then we agree with the law. We're, we're, we're agreeing with God. It's it's only through faith that you're going to agree with God because if you don't believe in him, you're not going to agree with him. The two big takeaways here are, uh, again, tying it to original sin. Everybody has this propensity. Uh, if you any Roman Catholics li- uh, listening, this would be a... Oh, crud. Did I lose it? C- uh, con- oh. It's a it's a weird word. Concupiscence, I think is how you pronounce it. Yeah, concupiscence. It's this the struggle of the flesh to desire things that it shouldn't. Basically, it just it threw me off when I was reading it. I was like, well, no, seven and eight. I, I, like my point was wrong, and we keep yeah. Anyway, so just uh, I want to talk a little bit more about this this commandment. Matt and I have kind of explained that the gospel is that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You know that that we are able to receive righteousness through faith apart from the law. That God credits us. Based on our faith, not based on our works, but based on our faith, he has elected to credit us as being forgiven and credit us with righteousness. That is the the commandment that we are judged on. Uh, me and Matt mentioned in the past, um, we've mentioned I think a couple times, Second Thessalonians 1 verses 8, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. First Peter 4 17, for it is a time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? The gospel is the greatest commandment. And uh, if you can tie this back to the uh, gospels, Matthew chapter 22, where they're asking, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? It's kind of interesting that Christ didn't respond with actual one of the Ten Commandments. He didn't. He responded with, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. That you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind is the gospel. It's the same from Deuteronomy 30, right? Uh, I read in verse 11, this commandment, which I command you today is not too difficult. Verse 10, if you obey the Lord your God and keep his commandments and his statutes, if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, that's the gospel. Call upon the name of the Lord. The only way you can do that is if you believe he exists and that you uh, are seeking him and walking in faithfulness. You are, tr- you are you are through faith trying to obey God's commandments. That's not a, a works-based righteousness. And you're not you're not credited as, as, as righteous because you are obeying the actual law or the commandments. You are declared righteous by your faith in following the Lord. Exactly. It's it's a it all you can see how it all ties perfectly together. From what Christ says to what Paul says, from what Paul quotes in Deuteronomy, the gospel is always the same. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind. Obviously, you can only do that when you call upon His name in faith and walk in faithfulness. And we've 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 proven that in in the other podcasts as well. What we're not, what we still haven't proven is, uh, can someone trust that? I mean, right here we have Paul 
spiritually dying at a later point in his life when he receives that commandment, but it doesn't say anything about him being able to understand that. So let's, let's keep moving. And, uh, actually we're going to jump kind of, so hang in there with us. Uh, we're going to look at at the book of life. (laughs) What we want to do is establish that, that a, everybody is under grace when they're born, that, that we are not born spiritually dead. We just saw in Romans nine, uh, Romans seven, excuse me, that Paul said he was spiritually alive at some point, and then he received the commandment and he spiritually died. We want to back that up with, with scripture about the book of life and how we are, our names are written in it from the beginning, but that he, God actively blots out the names of people that rebel from him. And then we'll, we'll give you, I think what is probably uh, the nail in the coffin, so to speak on the fact that spiritual death, is not something we are born into. It's something that occurs later in life and that it is specifically a separation from God because of our accountability to sin. Paul, in Romans 7 again, when he received that commandment, that sin came alive. Uh, that's, that's him being then accountable for his sin. And if he obeys the gospel by faith, then he will have that sin removed or he will have that debt removed. As uh, like Billy said, he God uh, Christ holds that debt. Excuse me, holds that debt, or he will continue in life, not repent, not have faith in God, not trust Him and seek Him, honor Him, and that debt will will hang with him until he dies, and that spiritual death will turn into literal death, death, second death. So, just to remember what you're going to say, we we've already kind of started on this whole: Can you respond to the gospel? Right. Paul says, Paul is quoting from Deuteronomy in Romans chapter 10. Paul talks about him being alive um, and then dying when the commandment came. Again, why does the Lord say he has given us this commandment? But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart so that you may observe it. Anyone who thinks that you are spiritually dead and that you cannot respond to God. Verse 14 is very clear, which again, Paul quotes from. God gives you this commandment of the gospel so that you may observe it. He meant the elect. Sorry. (laughs) We are going to stop this episode here because we still have another hour of talking that we do on this subject, starting here with the book of life and going on to our ability or or inability to respond. Uh, So with that, we are going to stop. Again, you can find us on BibleBrodown.com. You can contact us at... Uh, BibleBrodown at gmail.com. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you on any questions or any comments that you have. And until next time, we are out. Bye.